We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Michelle Stewart was murdered in the Ayrshire village of Drongan on the 14th of November 2008. She was 17 years old. Her killer, John Wilson, having lain in wait for Michelle, stabbed her 10 times and was sentenced to life. The judge made clear that he should serve 12 years before he can apply for parole. But on Saturday, just nine years later, Michelle's sister Lisa received this letter from the Scottish Prison Service. It informed her that Wilson has now been approved for first grant of temporary release. Temporary release includes release for work, etc., for home leave, for short leave, for pre-release leave, and for unescorted day leave. If the First Minister were in this family's shoes, what would she think of receiving that letter? First Minister. Uh, if I was in uh, the shoes of the family, and let me take the opportunity today to convey uh, my deepest condolences to the family. Uh, if I was in the shoes of uh, that family, I uh, would be very upset to receive that letter, as I think every family uh, would. Uh, we have independent processes in place, uh, both uh, in terms of determining the guilt or otherwise of individuals accused of crime uh, and then independent processes in place to determine sentences. We also have, as Ruth Davidson is aware, independent processes in place to determine uh, whether uh, prisoners should be eligible for parole or other forms of release. Um, I will certainly uh, look closely at the individual case that Ruth Davidson uh, has raised today. <coughs> uh, as I say, these decisions are taken independently, but from a policy perspective, and this is a point I have made uh, previously in the Chamber, uh, where we consider there are changes required, then we will not hesitate uh, to make those changes. But it is important that our justice system uh, operates independently of ministers in individual cases. And I do believe that's something that members across the chamber agree with. Ruth Davidson. John Wilson was given a life sentence for murdering Michelle, but he won't serve life in prison. He won't even remain behind bars for the 12 year minimum that was recommended. He's been approved to be released unescorted back into the community in a little under 100 months. And we spoke to Michelle's family this week and, and Kenny, Michelle's father, says this. This was a premeditated murder. Why is he being considered for temporary release now when the judge said he should serve at least 12 years? How does this send the right message about Scottish justice? How is this a deterrent? When families like those of Michelle Stewart say they feel completely let down by the justice system, can the First Minister understand why? First Minister. Well, is I, I, I don't, don't know the uh, particulars of this case, which is why I said in my first answer I will look uh, carefully at uh, the details of this particular case. Uh, in terms of parole, and I'm not sure it is a, a case of parole from what Ruth Davidson has said, uh, prisoners required to serve uh, a certain proportion of their sentence before they can apply for parole. Temporary release is part of the rehabilitation process and these are decisions that are taken very carefully uh, by the Scottish Prison Service. Uh, risk assessments are made and uh, that will have happened I am sure in this case. None of that of course takes away from the upset that any family will feel uh, who've gone through the trauma of what this family have gone through uh, when they're faced uh, with the person found uh, guilty being released even if that is part of a rehabilitation process. As we uh, have uh, discussed in this chamber before, Ruth Davison and I, it is important we do have processes in place that help with the rehabilitation of prisoners. Uh, but it is also important that we get uh, individual decisions right, or the, the prison service and the parole board get individual decisions right. As I've uh, said uh, now twice, I'm not uh, familiar with the details of this case and why these decisions have been taken, uh, but I will give Ruth Davidson an undertaking today that I will look into uh, the particulars and the detail, and I would be happy to uh, correspond with her in greater detail when I've had the opportunity to do so. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister is right that this is a specific case, but the reason for raising a specific case is this. It's because the sense of injustice that is felt by Michelle's family isn't an isolated example. It is felt by grieving families right across Scotland. The family of Craig McClelland, killed by a convicted criminal who'd been illegally at liberty for six months after breaching his licence. The family of Moira Gilbertson, murdered by her ex-partner, who was allowed to walk free despite having beaten her up following his release for a previous murder. Like the family of Linda Macdonald, brutally attacked last year by Robbie McIntosh just days after he'd been released on home leave following a previous conviction for murder. 
We keep being told that criminals have rights that need to be respected, but who in the Scottish Government is standing up for victims' rights? What reforms are being delivered now to correct these injustices? First Minister. Well, firstly, some of the individual cases that Ruth Davidson has cited there relate to home detention uh, curfew. It is the case that home detention curfew is used uh, only for a very, very small proportion of the prison population and careful assessments are made. Uh, when uh, things happen uh, that all of us regret, lessons are learned. The, uh, the former uh, Justice Secretary, of course, established reviews uh, to be undertaken by Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary uh, and by uh, Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons to make sure that we are learning those lessons. Uh, but at the heart of this, and I do appreciate and accept that there are general principles uh, at stake here, and one of those principles is how we ensure that we are doing everything possible uh, to rehabilitate those who have committed crimes, because that is in the interest of victims of crime, and it is in the interest of society overall. Uh, Ruth Davidson uh, says, and I should say, as I've said previously, none of what I say in the general sense here is intended in any way to take away from the experiences of individual families in individual cases but generally Ruth Davidson uh, tries to suggest that somehow uh, the justice system in Scotland is loaded in favour of, of those who commit crimes and not victims I do not accept generally that that is the case we have one of the highest prison populations uh, in the whole of Western Europe uh, one of the reasons for the reforms we are undertaking is that we know for many prisoners, and I'm not talking about uh, the specific cases right now, but for many uh, prisoners, prison is not the most effective form of sentence. So it's right uh, that people are punished appropriately, and I absolutely agree with Ruth Davidson about that. It is absolutely right that the interests of victims are at the centre of our justice system, but we also owe it to victims and society to make sure we have a justice system uh, that also effectively rehabilitates uh, those who are capable of rehabilitation. These are never easy uh, balances to get right. But as Ruth Davidson herself uh, has acknowledged, as our colleagues south of the border uh, frequently acknowledge, it's important that we continue to make sure that we take all of these uh, factors into account in our justice system, and we will continue to do so. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister has reshub uh, reshuffled her cabinet this week, so we've got a new justice secretary in place. And here's what we need from him. We need a root and branch review of the way the justice system is operating. <laughs> We need greater transparency on sentencing so people like the Stewart family are told honestly what is going to happen when someone is convicted. We need victims to have a right to speak at parole hearings, which currently they are denied. And when so many offenders are committing crimes while out on parole or home release, we need to rebalance the system in favour of the law-abiding public. We all want to have confidence in the justice system. So isn't it time that the Scottish Government ordered that review so that confidence can be restored? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I, um, be before I address the substance of Ruth Davidson's question, can I say I would uh, be very happy to ask uh, the new uh, Justice Secretary, uh, assuming Parliament approves that appointment uh, shortly, to offer to meet with the Stuart family to hear directly uh, from them uh, about uh, their uh, experiences. Uh, but uh, can I also say in terms of some of the substance of Ruth Davidson's question, she talks about uh, the process of parole decisions. As I think I've said in the Chamber before, uh, discussions are already underway with the Parole Board for Scotland on uh, further reforms and possible development of the rules of procedure that they operate by. Um, and that uh, review will include whether any changes should be made following uh, the UK review of the, the War Boys case. So we are absolutely committed to ensuring that the parole process is as open and as transparent as possible. Uh, of course, it must operate independently of ministers, and I hope everybody would agree uh, with that. Uh, in terms of uh, wider review, there are, as I mentioned uh, earlier, two reviews already underway. Uh, after a, a previous case that Ruth Davidson has mentioned, and I think it is right that we take time to hear the conclusions of those before considering where, whether other action is required. But we will con continue to make sure that we have a justice system that reflects the needs and the interests of victims, uh, that assists us in helping to reduce crime, but also one uh, that does allow us, where it is possible to do, to aid the rehabilitation of prisoners, because that is in everybody's interest at the end of the day. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, yesterday the signatures of over 25,000 people demanding that this government values education and values our teachers were delivered to the government. First Minister, 
if education really was the driving and defining mission of this government, the EIS wouldn't have to send this message to the Deputy First Minister, would they? First Minister. Well, of course, there is a, a pay negotiating process uh, in place for education. Uh, the negotiations for uh, the next pay award are already underway. Uh, the body that takes that forward in education comprises uh, COSLA, the Scottish Government and the teaching unions. Uh, as a proud trade unionist, I, I would have thought that Richard Leonard would actually support the negotiating process that we have in place. Um, I understand that those negotiations uh, are making good progress. I hope they conclude uh, and conclude well soon. Of course, uh, the final thing I would say is that it was this government, the Scottish government, ahead of the UK government, ahead of the Labour Welsh government, that lifted the 1% pay gap. And of course, I was very proud uh, this week that it was this government that put forward proposals uh, for a 9% uh, pay increase over the next three years uh, for those working in our National Health Service. So this government's record is good and we will continue to take the decisions that are in the interest of our public service workers. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, the First Minister has repeatedly told us that education was her top priority. Yet for two years, the government has wasted time on an education bill that its own international advisers have warned is unnecessary and misguided. This week, John Swinney finally got the message, and he can spin all he likes, that ditching this bill is fast-tracking the reform, but nobody believes it. And what is also clear is that John Swinney at education is now reaping what he sowed at finance. Less than three weeks ago, he told the SNP conference that we were witnessing, and I quote him, a renaissance in Scottish education. First Minister, a renaissance of what? Rising class sizes, flagship legislation shelved, or overworked, underpaid and demoralised teachers preparing to ballot for industrial action? First Minister. Firstly, Richard Leonard says that nobody believes that our education reforms are being fast-tracked and accelerated. I hate to be the one to break it to Richard Leonard, but the Labour members on COSLA believe that because every single uh, party represented in COSLA signed up to that agreement. The fact is, these reforms are being fast-tracked. The agreement means implementation of the reforms will start now instead of it having to wait 18 months for the passage of legislation. And crucially, the agreement will see the new Head Teachers Charter begin to be implemented this year. You know, I, I suspect that the reason Richard Leonard and his colleagues are so upset uh, about this is because uh, they've been denied the opportunity to play politics with education during the passage of this bill to frustrate and to undermine the reforms. Well, instead, this government is getting on with the job. Budgets in education are rising, more money going to head teachers, important reforms being implemented more quickly, and the attainment gap starting to close. So we will get on with the job and we'll leave at Labour as usual, carping from the sidelines. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, the two main themes of this final week of term have been the government's record on education and the politicians who Nicola Sturgeon chooses to serve in her government. Gillian Martin described trans transgender people as, I quote, hairy knuckled, lipstick wearing, transitional transgender ladies. She also claimed that college PR staff, I quote, froth at the mouth with excitement if anyone in a wheelchair does anything that can be remotely described as an achievement. Now, minutes ago, Gillian Martin's name was removed from the list of new ministers. But the point is this. The First Minister knew about these comments and yet still proposed to put Gillian Martin in charge of further and higher education. And in the end, this is not just about the judgment of Gillian Martin. First Minister, this is about your judgment, isn't it? First Minister. Well, after FMQs, we will come on to the issue of ministerial appointments and I'll address uh, that issue uh, directly at that stage. But Richard Leonard opened his question by talking about the themes of this week. Let me just give him a flavour of the themes of this week from the perspective of the Scottish Government. NHS Scotland staff, a 9% pay rise. 
Uh, £20 million has been invested to lift people out of homelessness. A new target for fuel poverty, increased funding for university research and innovation. Uh, these are the things this government has been working on because these are the things that demonstrate day in and day out that this government is focused on getting on with the job of building a better Scotland. We have a number of constituency supplementaries. The first from Sandra White. Thank, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, I've met with local residents and businesses uh, who have been very affected by the recent fires in Sucky Hall Street, uh, School of Art and Victoria nightclubs. And uh, they've raised really concerning issues. And most of their concerns are not just individual issues, but issues about the future of Sucky Hall Street, much loved and great area in the city of Glasgow. Can I ask the First Minister what assistance the Scottish Government can provide to support those affected and also to ensure that Sucky Hall Street does indeed have a future. First Minister. Well, I'm of course aware that the fire at the School of Art has had an enormous impact on both businesses and households uh, across the city. That's why we have been working very closely with Glasgow City Council to offer support to those affected. I can tell the Chamber that later this afternoon, the Finance Secretary will set out details of a new hardship and relief fund for residents who have been displaced from their homes. Uh, this will see the Scottish Government make £1,500 available to each household, which will be match funded by the Council to make a total of uh, £3,000 for each household. Household. In addition, we will confirm increases in support for affected businesses, uh, increasing the amount that the Scottish Government contributes towards business rates from 75% to 95%. Uh, in terms of people affected by the fire at Victoria's nightclub, many uh, will also have been impacted by the art school fire and will be eligible for the support that we are announcing today. Uh, we do, of course, stand ready to continue to discuss with the Council what more we can do to support them and everybody affected by this tragic fire. Mike Rumbles. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The latest figures just released show that in the Grampian Health Board area, nearly 25% of patients urgently referred with a suspicion of cancer failed to receive their first treatment within two months. This is the worst rate in Scotland. The First Minister knows that NHS Grampian has lost out on £165 million under her own NRAC formula over the last nine years. Will she take action? to ensure that Grampian NHS now has the resources that are available to other health boards and every other health board to tackle this crisis in cancer care in the North East. First Minister. Well, of course, under this government, uh, as a result of the introduction of the NRAC uh, formula, which uh, replaced the Arbuthnot formula, uh, health boards who are under parity have been taken closer to parity than has ever been the case before. That's the action that's been taken by this government that wasn't taken uh, by previous uh, governments that the Liberal Democrats were uh, members of. In terms of uh, cancer waiting times, the uh, figures out uh, this week uh, show that we do have work to do with boards, including Grampian, to improve cancer waiting times. In terms of the 62 uh, day waiting time target, that's from referral to treatment. Uh, the median wait across Scotland is 40 three days. Uh, we've seen an increase in the number of patients over the last year uh, treated within uh, that target. The number of patients treated within it has gone up by more than 7%. But we continue to work closely with boards, including Grampian Health Board, uh, to make sure that we can see further improvements as quickly as possible. And I know that will be a key priority for the new Health Secretary. And Finlay Carson. Presiding officer, in April 2013, Nicola Sturgeon visited Stranraer to chair the meeting of a task force set up to uh, regenerate the area after ferry operator Stena moved to nearby Cairn Ryan. Despite the Scottish Government promising the people of Stranraer that it was committed to the regeneration of the town, it's almost seven years since the ferries left. Stranraer has been badly let down. The expansion of the existing marina is key to stimulating local regeneration and is a shovel-ready project. Can the First Minister give a commitment to the people of Stranraer that she will do everything she can to ensure that required financial resources are made available to progress this project sooner rather than later? First Minister. 
Well, we work with local councils, uh, including the council covering Stranraer, uh, around regeneration uh, and have done that every year this government uh, has been in office. Uh, the new uh, Cabinet Secretary for Transport and Infrastructure, I know we'll be happy to have discussions with the council about mo uh, what more we can do. But of course, in terms of the south of Scotland, we have already announced and are taking forward plans for a new south of Scotland uh, enterprise agency. The interim arrangements ha have been backed by £10 million of additional funding. Uh, and that is about making sure the actions are taken to support regeneration and business activity. That, I think, is a really positive development and one that I hope the member would welcome. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. I believe that when opposition parties criticise the government for a course of action and the government then ends that course of action, we should welcome it. So I am pleased to see that the education bill has been dumped uh, for the time being, at least. We'll continue to criticise the proposals that were in it, because those proposals were not only criticised by those who instinctively attack the government for everything or who play party politics. They were criticised across the political spectrum. They were criticised by teachers, parents, academics and others. Don't those people, most particularly teachers and pupils, have a right to be told now that this represents not just the ending of one bill, but a change of direction and a commitment to resource our education system properly, to make teaching the attractive profession that it needs to be again, and that will take money, not just the scrapping of one bill. First Minister. Well, firstly, as I said in response to Richard Leonard, uh, we are committed to taking forward uh, the reforms that we have embarked upon. And as a result of the Deputy First Minister's statement uh, earlier this week, uh, those reforms will be fast-tracked and accelerated. And I think that's in the interest uh, of pupils, uh, teachers and parents across the country. Investment in education is increasing, including the amount of money that is going direct to head teachers, to empower head teachers and allow them to invest resources in ways that help close the attainment uh, gap. Uh, we're also seeing uh, greater investment in the teaching profession and as I said earlier on of course negotiations continue about a pay settlement and why this is all important and why it's important that we don't uh, follow the advice of Patrick Harvey and others but instead continue to take forward these changes is because they're already leading to improvements. Uh, we're seeing record numbers of young people in positive destinations, we're seeing uh, a record percentage of young people getting five hires, we're seeing the attainment gap in our schools continue uh, to close, uh, we're seeing improvements around literacy and numeracy and we're seeing access to university and higher education more generally uh, widen. Uh, these are important outcomes and it's important that we continue the action that will see these uh, improvements continue and gather pace. Patrick Harvey. Well, we will continue to make the case that the Scottish Government should not be forcing through structural changes as opposed to resourcing changes for which they don't have a majority in Parliament. But, but I would like to end this session with a positive proposal in education, something the Government should be doing instead of just something that we think it shouldn't be doing. This is the third anniversary of the Thai campaign, Time for Inclusive Education, looking for an education system that meets the needs of Scotland lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex young people. A campaign which has political support from across the spectrum and I am pleased to see so many MSPs wearing the Thai campaign's rainbow tie in the chamber today. Can we have a commitment, can we have a commitment from the government that we won't let the fourth anniversary of that campaign pass without making the goal of truly LGBTI inclusive education a reality in Scotland's schools. First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, I'm very proud to wear the uh, Thai badge today and would want to take this opportunity to congratulate the Thai campaign on their third anniversary. Uh, a campaign uh, mainly driven by young people, which I think is an inspiration to young people everywhere across Scotland, showing the power of their voices to make positive and progressive change. Uh, and I, as I'm sure all MSPs uh, would do today, uh, pay tribute to them uh, for their positive example. Uh, as Patrick Harvey knows, the Scottish Government is working with uh, Thai to, and I'm quoting, promote an inclusive approach 
to sex and relationships education. Uh, this work has been done through the LGBTI Inclusive Education Working Group. Uh, that working group is chaired by the Association of Directors of Education. It includes representation from the Scottish Transgender Alliance, LGBT Youth Scotland and Stonewall, Stonewall Scotland. And recommendations from the working group are expected in autumn of this year. Uh, at that point, I'm sure everybody across the chamber will have an interest. I know the government and me as First Minister will have an interest in making sure that these recommendations are implemented as quickly as possible. Question number four, Willie Rennie. A GP shortage threatening out-of-hours services from east coast to west. Mental health waiting times skyrocketing. The worst cancer waiting times in six years. A&E waiting times missed months on end. And operations cancelled because surgical equipment isn't being sterilised for use. With a multi-million pound shortfall in health board budgets, the BMA say the NHS in Scotland is getting worse, letting down patients and letting down staff. So while the First Minister has replaced her Health Secretary, can she also now tell us what new policies that Health Secretary will now pursue to clean up this mess? First Minister. Well, for weeks, of course, Willie Rennie's been standing up saying the Health Secretary has to change. Now that the Health Secretary has changed, he stands up. It's not the Health Secretary, it's the policies uh, that have to change. Consistency has never been a particular uh, strong point uh, of Willie uh, Rennie. But we will continue to invest record sums in the National Health Service. We will continue to employ record numbers of staff in the National Health Service. We will continue to make sure that we're rewarding them for the work that they do. Uh, and we will continue to take forward the reforms, like the integration of health and social care, transferring more care into the community, shifting the balance of care that we know is so important to the future of our NHS. We're investing more uh, in additional training places right across the spectrum of health service employees. So we will continue with that important work of investment and reform. And it's that work that is delivering and will continue to deliver for patients, which is why uh, there is still such high patient satisfaction with our precious NHS in this country. Willie Rennie. The First Minister needs to know it's the policy and the leadership of the NHS yeah, yeah. that counts. I'm not hearing a commitment to change from the First Minister. That's perhaps why her own survey shows that people judge her performance on the NHS as getting worse. But if there is a crisis in the NHS, there is another in Scottish education. Nursery education rollout that's driving childminders and nurseries out of business. Yeah. Five-year-olds being made to sit utterly pointless Correct. tests. Yeah. A college Absolutely. sector hollowed Absolutely. out. And now the shambles of a cancelled yeah. education Absolutely. bill. Scottish education used to be the best in the world. Now it's just average. Letting down teachers, letting down pupils. Given that her own Growth Commission says the NHS and education would face years of added cuts, can she honestly say, can she honestly look Scotland in the eye and say that now is the time to hit the independence red button? First Minister. Well, I don't think uh, Willie Rennie does himself any credit with that ridiculous hyperbole uh, of a rambling, incoherent question. This is the government that has already increased childcare and is now working to double childcare for families and children right across uh, the country. This is a government that's overseeing right now a narrowing of the attainment gap uh, with record higher passes for our young people, more of our young people than ever before going into positive destinations after school. And of course, we saw in an Audit Scotland report about colleges just last week that this government hasn't just met its target in terms of places at colleges, we've exceeded the target in terms of the number of young places at colleges. So uh, despite and contrary to the ridiculous assertions of Willie Rennie, this is a government getting on with the job of improving education in early years, in school education, in colleges and in universities. And that's exactly what we're going to continue to do. Some further supplementaries. The first from John Scott. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I declare an interest as a farmer. First Minister will be aware that stocks of carbon dioxide are dwindling across Europe with several manufacturing plants not producing carbon dioxide for a variety of reasons. 
to leading to difficulties in Scotland's food and drink sector, leading to the closure of abattoirs, as well as reducing manufacturing capacity in our drink sector at a peak time of demand. First Minister, are there interim measures the Scottish Government can take to help those businesses facing very real difficulties until normal production is restored? And if there are, perhaps the First Minister could provide the food and drink sector and other vital industries of which she will be aware with the detailed reassurances they require. First Minister. These are issues that the Rural Economy Secretary is very closely engaged in supporting our businesses, our farmers, those in our food and drink sector uh, across the country and uh, he will be happy to write uh, to John Scott setting out uh, in more detail the actions that we are taking and uh, can continue to take. But I would say this, our food and drink sector is one of the most successful sectors of our economy uh, and partly because of the support that this government has given over an extended period of time and we will continue uh, to do that. Of course, one of the biggest risks uh, and the Tories will not like what I'm about to say here, one of the biggest risks to our food and drink sector uh, is the, the barriers to exports and to trade that comes from Brexit. So perhaps John Scott, as well as rightly, rightly raising these issues with the Scottish Government, could raise his voice with his UK Government colleagues uh, and uh, demand that they take action to give the certainty around trade that our food and drink sector, our agriculture sector, every sector of our economy so badly needs. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. I remind the Chamber of my appeal rule to the First Minister. DWP, DWP figures released this morning show thousands of families in Scotland hit by the Tories' two-child cap. Of those, 190 women were granted exemption under the rape clause. Ten of those in Scotland. Does the First Minister agree that no woman, not a single one, should have to relive the terrible experience of rape just to get the benefits to which they are entitled and that it's time to scrap the cap. First Minister. Well, these, these statistics are really horrifying. This chamber has debated the rape clause uh, on several occasions in the past and although it has always been really moving and many people very distressed by these discussions, it has always been, uh, I guess, debating it in the abstract. Uh, today we see evidence for the first time of the real life impact of the two-child cap and the rape clause on real women. Uh, 190 across the UK, 10 in Scotland. These are women who are having to disclose the fact that they have been raped and that that rape led to the conception of their child in order to access state support for that child. I think that is horrifying. I think it is grotesque. I think it is a stain on the reputation of the Conservatives uh, and uh, the Conservative government at Westminster. And the sooner uh, we get rid of the two-child cap and the rape clause, the better. And let me say as First Minister, there will never, ever, as long as I'm First Minister, be such policies in Scotland. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 6th of July, families, friends and industry representatives will gather at the Piper Alpha Memorial Garden in Aberdeen to remember the 167 men who lost their lives in the Piper Alpha disaster 30 years ago that day. The tragic events of that night are long past, but for so many across the North East and beyond, the pain, the loss, the suffering will never fade. So does the First Minister agree with me that we must never forget those who lost their lives, nor the family members and friends affected, and that we must ensure the highest possible standards of safety are maintained offshore to protect those who make their living on and around the rigs? First Minister. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with the member and thank him for raising uh, this issue in the chamber today. I think many of us across the chamber vividly remember the Piper Alpha uh, tragedy and the impact that had, not just in the northeast of Scotland, although uh, most importantly in the northeast of Scotland, but on everybody uh, right across our country. Uh, so firstly, yes, it is uh, important that those affected, those who lost their lives, the families and friends uh, of those who lost their lives remain very much in our thoughts at this particular time. Uh, but also, uh, secondly, and importantly for the future, that safety in the North Sea is something that is never, ever compromised on. I, over the past uh, three years or so, uh, during the tough times that the oil and gas sector have had, have had many discussions uh, with companies and interests uh, in the North Sea, and safety has always been at the heart of those discussions, and that is how it must always be. Uh, but for now, over the next few weeks, I know all of us across this chamber will be thinking of all of those affected uh, by the tragedy of Piper Alpha. Question number five, Richard Lockhead. 
Can I ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the potential impact on Scotland of a trade war between the United States and Europe following the recent imposition of new tariffs? First Minister. Well, we're very concerned that the US decision to impose tariffs on steel and aluminium uh, and the subsequent EU decision to impose tariffs on a range of US products will escalate into a full-blown trade war. Uh, this will affect Scottish producers and the Scottish economy. The United States is Scotland's largest international export market, worth £4.8 billion in 2016. Uh, the imposition of tariffs on bourbon and related spirits in particular increases the risk of uh, US measures on Scotch whisky. This could have a significant impact on an industry that provides around 10,000 full-time equivalent jobs in Scotland and, of course, a similar number in the wider supply chain. Richard Lockhead. Can I thank the First Minister for her answer and welcome the fact that she shares my concern that the potential impact of a trade war is compounded by Europe's decision to impose tariffs on American whiskey and bourbon in response to Donald Trump's decision to impose tariffs on aluminium uh, and steel. Given that the US is the Scotch whisky sector's most successful global market, worth £900 million in 2017 alone. And does the First Minister share my disappointment that it appears that the UK government did not formally object to the decision by the EU to add American whisky and bourbon to the list of tariffs? And will she make representations to the UK ministers uh, and also the EU authorities? to ensure we can minimise any potential impact on the Scotch whisky sector and will she please closely monitor this situation closely in the times ahead? First Minister. Uh, well, the Scottish Government will be uh, very closely monitoring this situation, uh, such as its seriousness for the Scotch whisky sector and other sectors of our economy. It was disappointing that the UK Government felt unable to object formally to the inclusion of bourbon on the list, uh, given the potential impact that we know this could have on Scotch whisky. If other tariffs are introduced by the US administration on whisky or other key products, then we would expect the UK government to mitigate or to compensate businesses for the damage that will be done to export markets. But we will continue to engage with the UK government and continue to do all that we can to protect the interests of the whisky sector, which of course is so important to our overall economy. Question number six, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking regarding Scottish Canal's financial situation. First Minister. Uh, Scottish Canal's carries out vital work managing Scotland's waterways. The Scottish Government is the main source of funding for the organisation, although it also has other sources of income, including investments and commercial revenue. In this year's budget, we increased our funding from £10 million uh, in 2016-17 to uh, £11.6 million, a rise of 16%. We also increased the organisation's capital allocation by £500,000 to £3.5 million. We are aware, however, of the financial difficulties it has faced due to the enforced closure of bridges on the Forth and Clyde Canal. Uh, so I'm pleased to be able to confirm today that we will provide an additional uh, just over £1.6 million of capital grant in aid to enable Scottish canals to repair the Bonnie Bridge and Twecker Bridges and carry out uh, further work at the Ardashig Pier as well. Edward Mountain. I thank the First Minister for that answer and I also thank her also for ensuring extra investment. But the problem is Scottish canals still face a shortfall of some £70 million of outstanding repairs. Now, recently, Scottish canals have been more interested in investing in shops, holiday lettings and commercial ventures than repairing waterways. Now, if, if, if you don't agree with me, just look at their asset management budget, which highlights this very fact. And the last thing they quote is a priority is when funds allow, and I quote, to facilitate navigation. Will the First Minister ensure that Scottish canals keep our canals open across all of Scotland, including the Highlands. First Minister. Well, uh, you know, I think the member should look at the resurgence of canal traffic in Scotland. He should perhaps visit Falkirk uh, or indeed parts of Glasgow. Uh, and then he will see that the premise of his question, uh, I think, is completely misguided and, Frank, utterly wrong. Uh, of course, Scottish canals, uh, like many uh, parts of the public sector in Scotland uh, are under uh, financial pressure. I have to say, if we'd followed uh, the Tory recommendations in the Scottish budget, we wouldn't have been able to announce, just, as I have done, the additional money for Scottish canals, because we would have been looking for £500 million of cuts. The member also complains about the other activities of Scottish canals. That is partly about bringing in additional commercial revenue uh, and is all activity that I think should be welcomed. So I think Scottish canals have actually done a very good job. 
yes, they uh, do face financial pressures, but this government will continue to work with them to ensure that they can address these pressures, just as I've demonstrated with the announcement of additional money today. Money that would not have been available had we followed the advice of the Scottish Conservatives. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's